Please join me in welcoming director Joaquin Del Paso and cinematographer Frederick Olson. I'm going to start with a detail um, since we have Frederick here. You shot this on expired film stock. Um, I'm assuming that was a decision that you made together. But um, maybe we can talk about the themes of that. This is where we're talking about the kind of the end of machinery. Um, and but also it also also the feeling it gives to the film. Maybe you could both talk about this, uh, this idea and this sort of tone that it lends. Well, shooting on expired film stock um, wasn't a choice. It, it, we had to do it. We didn't have. We didn't actually have much choice. So uh, it was either like that or not at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Tell me more. Um, so uh, basically, when when the idea to make the film uh, came up, we had very little time to to execute it because the the place that you just saw in the movie was about to be demolished. And the people in that company were about to move to another to another workspace, uh, so we had to move very quickly. And we both studied at the film school in Poland, in Łódź, and we we come from a tradition of of 35 millimeter film, and we had a lot of contacts in in Fuji, which is a company that doesn't exist anymore. So I had the option to shoot the film uh, in with a digital camera, and I was not very happy about it. But I knew that it could be the my fate. Uh, when I got an e we got an email from Fuji saying they had all this uh, expired stock they were gonna throw away if we wanted the stock. So we said, of course. So we got the stock. That was first part. Then we got the camera for free uh, because it, it it had been in in. In Carlos Regadas's warehouse for many ye years, uh, and he got it. He just left it be uh, because he was very thrilled to see what we could do. And we went to the lab. That was the third piece uh, that was missing for making it. And the lab was about to close, and they were bankrupt. And they were very, very excited about the film, about uh, bankruptcy and shutting and expire. I mean, er all the pieces of a world that was about to disappear came together and that's a uh, and of course it was great uh, I think for the look of the film to have this uh, a temporary moment a uh, feel to it and not a very digital and modern I think it's it works and but we have to agree it was a little bit of good luck yeah it was risky but um, I mean, as Joaquin said we were we, we agreed on it straight away we, we we didn't argue uh, anything. When he proposed to shoot it on 35, it was, uh, of course, was a natural choice. Yeah, the, the crew was a bit freaked out <laughs> uh, because they didn't know us. We were, I just came from Poland, nobody knew me, and we were like, yeah, it's no problem, we'll do it. And we had very little ratio to shoot the, every shot. We could repeat it two or three times, tops. Uh, so they were, n many people were not used to that, but we managed to to make a film. So um, you needed to shoot it in this factory. Can you talk about how you came across that and how that decision was made? Mm. So um, after I finished my cinematography studies, I, I wrote a film, uh, a screenplay, for a film about a, a, bl a big village that it starts to become blind. And it was also, a, or it is also a collective film, a film with many characters and in some way similar, but uh, it was very difficult to make. So the first weeks I arrived, I, I just noticed that it would be very hard to, to raise the money. And at the same time, I, uh, I found this location uh, because my father, who used to work in a, well, my grandfather and my father, they used to have a company called Maquinaria Panamericana, which went bankrupt in 1995 in, the, in a huge economical crisis. Uh, and that, uh, and then he moved on and worked in other places in the business, in the same thing of the yellow machines. And uh, when I moved back from Poland, he had a new job, and he took me to uh, one day to his office, and it was this place. And I just walked around and made a few videos and shots, and I thought, wow, this is really special. And in the car, he said, if you want to make a film, we're gonna, it's going to be demolished. So 
you can do it. So instantly I changed my mind uh, and I thought I would do something that, re that uh, brought me back to, to my childhood in a way. And that also uh, portrayed a world that was disappearing and I found that uh, uh, kind of sad and uh, interesting to make a film because all the, most of the people you saw in the film, they, 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 uh, they actually work there. And, and the film gave them the opportunity to, to, you know, to, to kind of participate in, in, in something that went beyond uh, anyone's uh, imagination. No? Uh, what was that participation like? Um, so you, you wrote it very quickly then. Um, what was the collaboration like in the end? With, uh, with, uh, with the actors, uh, I suppose? Or no, I mean, we, we wrote the film in three months, so it was pretty quick. And by the fourth month, we were shooting already. So there were uh, the, the, the people, they, weren't, they didn't know what to expect. So when we arrived with a small crew with just a big weird camera and uh, a lot of young people because we, at that time we were, uh, I was 27 and Frederick was 29 uh, and the line producer was 17. So, uh, <laughs> so they thought, you know, at the beginning they thought it was a little bit weird, uh, but suddenly they realized it was uh, very serious, but fun, you know, because that's the way we wanted to keep it serious but always having fun and enjoying it. Not always was it, we could make it, but uh, they actually slowly started to take it very, very seriously till a point where they were actually demanding that they, they, they should be, that their scene shouldn't be this way but this way and they did this last way and that their costume was not this way but the other way. So they also helped the, the film to give like certain, um, how say, like rigor. Uh, mm, Rigor, I don't know, like they, yeah, yeah. yeah Rigor, yeah, like they really helped, yeah. But uh, many of them were about to lose their jobs? Um. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and the film also helped to, uh, well, nobody really know who would lose their jobs. Uh, the people that were in, the, in uh, the eldest, they were about, they were gonna retire because they, they, they decided to retire. Uh, so there was a, I wouldn't say it was like a, a drama like in the film, it was uh, much more soft, you know, uh, but uh, there was this feeling of nostalgia, of leaving this place that had absorbed the life of so many people. Like the desks were all scratched by, by, by different workers that they put a little heart when they were in love in 1992 and the heart was still there and a picture and the whole space absorbed the life of so many people working. That was something that impressed us a lot. And I think they were, uh, they were happy that uh, they could finish an era in this, in this way. So it was not as tragic maybe as in the movie. I don't want to ask you directly about references exactly, but maybe I want to talk about since it sort of shifts into so many different kind of feelings, um, and narratively, uh, you move forward, but you know you, you're never stuck on exactly one character or one arc. Um, I was just sort of want to ask you about this um, this arrangement, um, and you know what like making um, decisions you made and wanting to make a film with this kind of um, this sort of mix of all of these sort of interesting sort of reference and ideas and tones and um, sort of, you know, moods. Uh, so it was a, a very intuitive process because of the speed uh, we had to do it. So we had to rely a lot of an, our, our, of that first drive we had when we entered the space and we, know, and we heard the story. Uh, also, when we heard the story of the ex-owner, like the previous owner of that company that used to live in that little room that you saw in the film, and he spent the last years of his life inside this room. So the, the mix of, of everything was uh, very strong, but we had to move very, you know, with the, like believing in our intuition, you know? Um, and um, the idea of making a collective film was from the beginning, that was from the start. We wanted to make a film about a group of people. We wanted to make a film that, that, that talks um, not about uh, an individual but a collective because through the collective I believe we can analyze other things that we can do with the individual. 
Because we can always say, oh, this guy, well, he behaved this way, but that's him. But all this group is behaving this way, and that, that is another way of analyzing ourselves through the way we communicate in a, in a group. So I, I, I was very thrilled. I was, at that point, I was very thrilled with the, maybe some Jack Tati films, which actually, uh, but for maybe other ideas than in La La Land or something like this. More about the idea of the collective, not the idea of the of the colors and the and the and the sparks. And I was interested in Berlanga's films, and I'm still very interested in Luis Buñuel as a character and as a as a, an artist that always broke things. Uh, uh, so I think that was a lot. And well, uh, Frederick is uh, from Sweden, and uh, he worked a lot with uh, Timo Salminen, who is uh, Aki Kaurismaki's uh, DOP. Uh, we were friends in school, that was not the reason we met, but we, uh, we always had uh, shared a little bit the, the humor of Scandinavian uh, films and, uh, and I think a little bit of that is there and also in the way we shot and in the lamps he put straight in the faces of the people and you know, yeah. Okay, I can open it up for questions. Let's just start. Yes. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm glad that we're here uh, today because we can maybe start a, a different discussion uh, than the ones that I'm used to having by showing the film. Uh, the film, uh, of course, it is the, the head of the, of the boss was cut off, as you would say, or he died. And uh, we always thought this, this would uh, symbolize, in a way, the way we're we're so attached to the, to this paternal figure in our in the way we run our our politics, and uh, and the fear of losing that head is is bigger than the than the than the, it creates a very big sorry it creates a very big fear of changing no so we uh, by the in the moment we made the film we see it seemed like Mexico doesn't want to change or we cannot change or we're stuck in the in a circle and now we have a, another problem which is that uh, there's other countries that also want to build walls and and they want to you know like the world is changing so the film was made in a moment where we I was just thinking in a way about Mexico maybe if I had done the film now it would be a bit different and it would be interesting how the film could uh, talk about the different layers. First of all, our fear of changing, then the fear of the, of the world, of the others changing, and you know, so it's it's uh, it's very interesting for me to show the film today, and uh, and it's uh, it opens me questions that I never even thought about. You know, anyway, I think there is an opportunity of of changing. I always believe some people say. Uh, that they close themselves in the factory at the end, and then the, that's maybe the end. But I think maybe it's the beginning of of, of, of a tribe that is just re coming in. Uh, it doesn't have that. Uh, they lost that leader. They they had like an exorcism by night, drinking the purple drink, and now they're ready to maybe make another other decisions that will lead them to one day become a, a prosperous society. You know, that's what I think uh, could happen in my head. Although you know. Everyone can read uh, something different, yeah. But uh, thanks about the T-Rex. Yeah, that's. I I think. Uh, yeah, that was uh, our flashy production shot. <laughs> we bought that car for two hundred dollars, and we had to pull it with ropes in the shot where you see it moving. And then uh, we had we only had one chance to destroy it. Uh, I, with, together with Lucy Pavlak, who is not here, but she's uh, my co-script writer and also the art director of the film, we are, uh, we've had a long time collaboration since we met in Poland and we're writing a new script and it's a collective film and it uh, touches religion and that's so far what I would like to say because I want you to go and see it. Where are you producing it? It's in Mexico City, and it's a film about a, a, a group and things that happen when we're all together. Yes. I 
It's funny, but there's a... Uh, uh, I, I, I just, uh, writing the dialogues, I, I thought of uh, what happened in 1995, which was that uh, uh, the famous, uh, I don't know how you call it in English, TLC, uh, the treaty that now they're... This NAFTA. The NAFTA, sorry, the NAFTA deal just happened. And uh, many, uh, because the, the, the peso, Mexican peso, crashed, many American companies came and just bought a lot of uh, companies that were about to to, to be finished. So there was always, a, um, in my mind, I always kept a little bit uh, the, this idea of, of like the Americans will come and you know, I, it's just, it's nothing serious, it was nothing serious, maybe now it has another reading, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I just thought like, a, you know, in that, ca in that moment of stress when nobody knows who, what's going on with this daughter, then the only thing this guy can imagine is just say, like, he works for the gringos. The same as you, maybe in American film, they would say, he's a commie or, you know, something like this. Yeah, I nothing mean, very serious about it. I think, in, I mean, in general, um, I think in the American imagination, if we think of uh, a Mexican factory, it's often the maquilladora on the, on the border, um, these sort of almost like, you know, these, these sort of big anonymous, um, you know, sort of slave wage places, but you're depicting this um, more, a sort of what we consider like a classic sort of familial, you know, sort of small business kind of thing. Um, maybe you can talk about this sort of yeah, um, these uh, places are like if you go in Mexico City, so if these places still exist in a way because they belong to a period in our history that was uh, pretty prosperous and where, you know, we didn't have all the trouble uh, that we have right now. And these uh, companies that were uh, family companies and that uh, they, 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 they treated work in a very different way as we treat today. Uh, they still exist, although they are disappearing very quickly. And maybe if you go to the province or to the, you know, not in Mexico City, you will still see a lot of, of this uh, universe. And, and it was just a, a way for me to, to depict the, the uh, to make like a little, um, let's say, a documentation of a world that is about to disappear. And also for me, it was very interesting, the, the comment of this, old capitalism and the new capitalism and how you know they are just crashing and and the the values of work and the, this kind of familiar not very productive thing but but for sure nice uh, it does is is finishing no we're now it it seems we're in another universe yeah time for just a couple more yes so it was uh, mm, the real budget or the fake one? <laughs> <laughs> the the real. <laughs> we we started out without any money, right? Yeah. Maybe you can say that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please ask something to Frederick. He came all the way from Poland, <laughs> and he has a lot of things interesting. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, the the film. Uh, so Frederick and me, we graduated from the film school. We got money left, f uh, like from our budget for making shorts. And I knew he had money left, I had money left, so I called him, I was already in Mexico, and I said, listen, I, there's this film I want to shoot, it's a little bit crazy, I don't have a script, but do you want to put your, your, your money in it? And, and he said, of course, of course. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we, Frederick in Poland started to make all the, the procedures with the school, I, I started to raise all these things, like the lab, the negative, all this thing, uh, so uh, initially we just had like maybe 500,000, uh, 10,000, 20,000 to make the film. Uh, that was where we came from Poland, but uh, after the second week, uh, my li li line producer uh, said uh, there's no money left and we, we have to do something. So I, I had to decide if to maybe risk the quality of the film by not having this or that or borrowing. So I borrowed some money uh, and we managed to pull off the shoot with a lot of stress and, and we, 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 yeah, not recommended, but we had to do it. And uh, later on, I was, I, I was at home, Frederick was gone uh, to Poland. I was alone with my footage, uh, feeling depressed and lonely and broke. 
And I started to edit these little teasers or trailers that were actually like very funny, slapsticky thing. And the people love this, and I started to get uh, more and more, uh, let's say, partners in the film in many different ways, post-production, so little, little pieces that, that made the puzzle. And at the end, the Mexican Film Institute came uh, with, the, with the money for post-production. So the film was like $400,000 in total, if you count all the things that were free and that were given, just like a, in species. And this is when in, you in, in kind, sorry, not in speech. When you mentioned some of the um, tricks and things that you came up with, uh, along with the expired film stock, um, to different lighting, lighting tricks and different tracking tricks and things that were maybe impro improvised. Well, we, we had to adapt, uh, as Joaquin said. I mean, uh, both to money and everything, but we, since we could spend so much time on location, uh, and it was basically given to us for free, um, we we just had to use intuition. I mean, it's, it was kind of easy for me to understand what Joaquin was aiming for. Uh, and uh, what about the stock? Well, we, as Joaquin said, we only had this much and this much for each scene, so it was very well calculated, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think what we did was that we to try to take very good care of all the little surprises, like when the weather changed or when uh, when we saw something that unexpected, and or we changed something for for from day to night, or we changed position in the factory, it was uh, it was a big puzzle. But uh, uh, yeah, we, we well. yeah and yeah that was a big thing. We we one day when we came to location, it had been a big storm and a rain, so we entered the apartment where the boss lived, and it was uh, f water up to here and. The film stock was floating around in the room next door. Uh, so there was a big panic because we had to start shooting in 30 minutes. And scenography was trying to get the water out. And after a while, we just said, but, well, this is great. Let's just leave it. Uh, uh, and all these little things kind of, uh, I mean, it brings something extra to the, to, the, to the place, to the story, to the film. Okay, I'm forbidden from asking or allowing any further questions at this moment, but Someone. we are, um, it, but we're having a party uh, just across the hallway and uh, hopefully Frederick and Joaquin will be available to chat. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there and all weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.